Tora, if we could all please stand while our Kamata Wapiti Prentice uh, opens us with a karakia. Tēnā Acknowledgements from the Council of Napier and from Kirsten, those who are wel welcoming you here today. This issue that has been known before us all, let us be strong and be together. Be steadfast. To you all who have come, those who have departed, let us mourn you. And to let them sleep in the of peace. To you all, rest. and to us. The living faces. I acknowledge you all. Thank you. Welcome everybody to our Māori Ward hearings. It's a pleasure to have you all here today. 
Uh, first, I would just like to uh, call the apologies. Councillor Brown, do I have a mover? Thank you, Councillor Bogue. Seconded by Councillor Crystal. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Do we have any conflicts of interest? Um, excuse me, Your, your Worship. Uh, through obviously trying to get a lot of community engagement, um, I did actually have my father and also my wife submit, but I come here for the next three days with an open mind. Thank you, Councillor Mawson. Uh, announcements from myself. I do just want to uh, acknowledge our recent uh, Super Saturday Vaxathon on the weekend where Hawke's Bay led the charge nationwide and had the largest percentage per head of capita uh, vaccinated on the day. I say a huge thank you to all the staff, community members and elected members that helped out on the day. Um, it is fantastic and now in uh, Ahariri we are sitting with 81% with their first vaccination so we're certainly making some really good gains. It's great um, to be moving forward in that regard. And secondly, uh, another very special announcement today. It is Deputy Mayor Brosnan's birthday. So a very happy birthday to you, Deputy Mayor. And um, we will um, definitely be celebrating over the dinner break. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, notification of minor matters. Any announcements by management? Um, no announcements from management, Mayor Weiss. Thank you. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed via Council's Facebook page. Uh, submitters will have 10 minutes for their presentation and questions from councillors, and there'll be a bell at 10 minutes. Just to let you know, though, we are pretty flexible with our times, and really it is just about being respectful, knowing that there's a group of you that we need to get through in the allocated time space, uh, and so being respectful and ensuring that others have time to speak as well. And I did just want to say, uh, because Māori wards obviously is something that many of us do feel quite passionately about, and just a gentle reminder to all of us here today, this is elected members and people that are submitting, to be respectful of the people that are in the room. We do have standing orders which can be invoked if we feel that the behaviour is not um, acceptable for this very, very important um, occasion, so it is just a gentle reminder to everybody involved. Um, and also, just as we are in level two COVID restrictions, masks are required at all times unless you have a medical exemption, uh, and also the two metre distancing is required between people not in the same work or home bubble. Uh, so we will get straight into our submissions now, and I would like to welcome Chad Tariha. Uh, to come and open up for us today with the first submission, and I think he's supported by Nari Brown. Welcome to both of you. Oh, Mayor Wise, I've been advised um, presenters can take the mask off. Are you all right with that? Oh, kia ora, thank you. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Piri for opening uh, our meeting with the Karakia. Uh, you opened this meeting and I acknowledge <coughs> you for that. Thank you. I look above to my mountain and pass site to the the bathing walls of the the river reaches the ocean Tāri Hāti Moana Nui, Te Mema Parimata, Māori. 
in the Māori um, I recall the journey of my ancestor into Onione in Taiponu this is the lineage of Tariha to Moananui. The connections to Waimarama, to do a hapia, and to Wairoa. That is the lineage of Tariha to to us, the living faces. I acknowledge us all who have congregated here today. My name is Chad Tariha and I acknowledge you all. All within this house. Thank you all. Uh, kia ora, good afternoon, everyone. Ete kahika, mia wais te nga koe. To you, the chief, mia wais, I acknowledge you. The councillors and the staff of the council, thank you and I acknowledge you. Ete tumi whakarai, Steph Rotarangi, te nga koe. A te nga koutua, te rā, te nga tātou katoa. Acknowledgements to all. Uh, kia ora, my name is Chair Tariha and I'm presenting two submissions this afternoon. These are on behalf of the Ngāti Pāro Hapu Trust and Ngā Mā Nuku Nuku Te Iwi, the Napier City Council Māori Committee. Ngāti Pāro are one of seven mana whenua hapu or local sub-tribes of the Ahuri the Napier area. The Ngāti Pāro Hapu Trust is an entity established to represent the Ngāti Pāro Hapu. The purpose of the trust is to promote, uphold and enhance the mana and tino rangatiratanga of the hapu to support and work with the Wao Hikimurai trustees and to support the social, cultural and economic advancement of the region. The Trust is engaged in various projects to further its own aspirations and that of the community. We currently represent approximately 250 adult members of this community. Although Wao Hikimurai and region sits within the Hastings district area, many Wao Hiki whānau did, did their schooling in Napier, work in Napier, shop in Napier, and it wasn't actually that long ago while Hiki was a part of Napier. I am a direct descendant of Tariha Te Moananui, a paramount chief of Ngāti Kaununu Ki Ahuriri, at the time of the arrival of Donald McLean and the Crown to Ahuriri. Our Tariha Te Moananui was one of the first four Māori members of Parliament and was the first Māori to speak in Parliament. Our Tariha, along with other Ahuriri rangatira, wrote a letter to Donald McLean inviting him here to purchase land to establish a settlement. In November 1851, Donald McLean, on behalf of the Crown, purchased the Ahuriri block. It is evident from the pursuit of this partnership that our tipuna saw the advantages and benefits of working together with our non-Māori friends and communities. But almost 171 years later, where has this left us and what has been achieved? A Ngā Mā Nuku Nuku Te Iwi has representatives from Ngā Te Pārau, a post-settlement governance entity Maunga Hareru Tangitu, a representative from Mirainui District and Community Trust, two representatives of the community and three elected representatives of council, including Mayor Wise. Uh, the question before consideration of Napier City Council today is, does the City of Napier support the establishment and implementation of Māori constituencies? As stated in our submissions, we are in strong support of Napier City Council implementing Māori constituencies with urgency. It was the first recommendation of Ngā Mā Nuku Nuku Te Iwi to the Napier City Council to implement Māori wards with urgency. I would like to start by redrawing your attention to this recommendation as I feel this recommendation has been lost due to everything that's happened over the year. Uh, having a councillor or a representative on the council who is elected directly by the Māori electoral roll would ensure that, specifically, that a specifically Māori perspective is present in voting in all local decision making. Given the ever increasing legislative importance of recognising and incorporating such perspectives into all local decision making, Establishing Māori constituencies could only lead to better council processes and outcomes. 
Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, was a partnership agreement signed between the Crown and Māori and promising the 50-50 partnership and representation. However, uh, Māori interests have traditionally been underserved and starved of representation. Therefore, establishing Māori constituencies will certainly help towards correcting some of those historical injustices. Uh, furthermore, establishing Māori constituencies would ensure guaranteed Māori representation, which would better reflect our constitutional status under Te Tiriti o Waitangi. I would also like to address some misinformation circling our communities causing some concerns regarding Māori wards giving Māori special privileges. I've actually looked into it and can't seem to find where Māori wards give Māori special privileges, so I was just wondering maybe during question time you may be able to help me answer that question. Um, also, in actual fact, I have found the op complete opposite. Um, to my understanding, establishing Māori constituencies actually strengthens the voices of the non-Māori communities. I think it is also important to note that, establishing, that the establishment of Māori wards does not provide for unelected Māori councillors or give those on the Māori role more votes or more chance for election. I'm happy to explain this further during question time too, um, but I'm also, also uh, happy to leave that there. Establishing Māori constituencies will add to Council's ex existing methods of engaging with Māori, not replace them. They provide another avenue for issues of priority, uh, concerns or interests to Māori on the Māori electoral roll to be brought more directly to the Council's table and attention. Establishing Māori constituencies may also increase Māori participation in uh, local body elections. This is not guaranteed, and you'll never know till you give it a go. <laughs> However, we currently have an opportunity to make some positive changes for our community at the moment. Um, in conclusion, we have no hesitation in supporting Napier City Council with implementing Māori constituencies for the City of Napier. Uh, the risk of a no vote means Council can't do a lot without Māori. So please vote yes for Māori wards and guaranteed Māori representation. Please vote yes to correcting some of those historical injustices. Please vote yes for upholding the principles of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Uh, now, Napier City Council has a responsibility to make the best decision for the City of Napier, and I, um, I'm confident that this time around that the Council will make exactly that decision. Uh, I'd just like to leave you with a whakatauki from uh, the late Whadihuia. Um It goes, uh, hopu, uh, tu whitea te hopu, mai rangatea te angi tu, which means uh, feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> uh, huri noe tō tātou nei whare, a uh, tēnā koutou, a uh, tēnā koutou te rā, uh, kia ora mai tātou katoa, kia ora. Kia ora, Jade, thank you. I'll just open up for questions from councillors. Councillor Tapani. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Ngā mihi nunui ki a koe, Chair, mi rātou hapu hoki. My question, I've got two. The first one is, in your submission, you mentioned that having representative elected directly by those on the Māori electoral roll ensures that specific Māori perspectives are present within the votes of Council. Also in the submissions we've received, and I noted it a number of times, that uh, there are a couple of comments that we've already got Māori councillors on Napier City. Could you help me understand, mostly to address those comments, what's the difference between someone like myself, who is on council through a general election, but of Māori descent? What's the difference between me and someone who is elected specifically by Māori to represent Māori? Because the comments in the submission suggest that I am able to do that. What's your opinion? Uh, um, thank you for your question. I think that refers back to the mandate. Um, so the difference is the mandate coming directly from the Māori community. So, and I acknowledge um, your mahi and the council. However, your mandate is your constituencies is. Um, you have to focus on your ward and not particularly Māori at, at large. Or, 
So your mandate comes from your constituencies where the, uh, if we have a, had a representative elected directly from the Māori electoral roll, their ma mandate will come directly from the Māori community. So I suppose that would be the difference. They will be upholding the, the views and the, the values and the principles of the Māori community alone and not uh, the wider community. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. Hang on, I'm here. So, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. That that's absolutely um, does answer my question. It's about the difference in mandate for me as well. So thank you for that clarity. My second question, I actually had in a third one, but I'm going to whittle it down to two. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your submission on behalf of Ngāti Pārō. Um, would you say that in your opinion as chair of the committee for a Māori consultative committee and your representative role here for Ngāti Pārō, would you say that based on the com question I just asked around mandate, would you say that a seat on a committee such as the Māori Consultative Committee is equal to a vote at the table? Do you need one or the other or both? Both would be good. Uh, sitting on the committee you, you do have speaking rights, however you don't have the voting rights, so I suppose if you're elected, you're elected member, you you get the money of uh, also voting on decision um, during decision making processes. So that's a real big difference. Although we can speak in, on committees that may inform decisions, but you're not actually making the decision, you're not actually putting your stamp on uh, any decision. So that's a, a real big difference there is getting that vote. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you. Are there any further questions from other councillors? Namihi Chad, thank you for coming today. Kia ora, thank you. Kia ora. Yeah. I'll acknowledge as the chat submission. I'd now like to invite Mark Cleary up to present to us, please. Acknowledgements to all. It is only right that I acknowledge uh, the tribe of Ngāti Kahunganu and the sub-tribe of Te Whanganui uh, Aorotu. My name is Mark Cleary. I'm just acknowledging the people who have governed um, this district for a long time before the settlers came. Thank you for the opportunity to present as you consider Māori wards for the 2025 election. I'm strongly in favour of Māori wards and urge each of you to vote for their adoption. As a former history teacher, secondary school principal, Napier Pilot City trustee and Maturuaho resident, I believe there are numerous compelling historic, democratic, socio-economic and environmental reasons why a yes vote is your only possible option. When Māori signed to Te Tangi in 1840, they believed they were entering an agreement with the Crown, a partnership where they would firstly cede governorship, Kawanatanga, to the English Crown, retain sovereignty, Tino Rangateratanga, possession of their whenua and tonga, and gain citizenship rights and protection of the world's leading superpower. As you'll know from having read the key by Tangi Tribunal reports that cover Ahiriri, the Fanu and Hapu of Ngāti Kahununu instead received subjugation, were disenfranchised and were subject to land confiscation and theft. Historically, three recollections illustrate that the Crown's local government in Napier has abysmally failed to honour Te Tiriti. In the early 1980s, while I was teaching at Hastings Boys High School, I read the 1873 Hawke's Bay Native Lands Alienation Commission report that detailed how land was moved from Māori possession to private settler ownership. This should be compulsory reading for all our locally re elected representatives, as it starkly illustrates how Tangata Whenua were systematically stripped of their land and denied the opportunity to share in economic prosperity. In the 90s, teaching local history at Kalenzo High School, I learned the story of Pukimokimoki Island, 
that within 20 years of being guaranteed a Māori reserve in A level for all time in the 1851 Ahereri purchase that Chad referred to, um, the island was bulldozed and used as filled to reclaim swampland in central Napier. Ironically, this is where both the Napier City and Hawke's Bay Regional Councils are now headquartered. This is detailed in, in a number of reports. Finally, in 2007, at the opening of the Pukimoki Moki Marae, I recall hearing how Karehas Rock, and again I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chad's presence here in his whanau, the home of Pania and her kaitiaki son Morimori, and a special fishing spot for the Tariha Fana was destroyed for harbour development purposes. This work was commenced in 1929 and continued to the Napier earthquake of 1931. Without doubt, these devastating events and countless others would not have happened if Māori had retained their representation at the government's table and had been able to exert their promised Hina Ringa Te Rautanga. Despite the treaty being our founding document, New Zealand is rare in modern democracies in not having special governance arrangements that safeguard and guarantee key constitutional arrangements. In the United States, states' rights are embedded in the Constitution. This has results that every one of the 50 states in the, unit, in the Union elects two senators. Therefore, Wyoming, with a population of just over 750,000 people, has the same representation in the Senate as the nearly 40 million citizens of California. The United States, South Africa, Canada and Australia all have similar arrangements that ensure key constitutional interests are protected. In our democracy, only one treaty partner misses out. If Te Tiriti o Waitangi is our nation's founding document and using similar democracies around the world as the model, power sharing arrangements would be entrenched. Viewed within this context, the current Māori ward proposal is actually a token and small bickies. Ironically, had a two-chamber representational democracy been established in 1840 following the treaty, population distribution would have meant that Māori would have held 88% of the seats in the House of Representatives, as well as probably 50% in the Tatariti based upper chamber. Imagine the immigration laws that would have been passed. The socioeconomic statistics, both nationally and across Hawke's Bay, show that our current structures have and continue to fail Māori. Clearly, one of the treaty partners has been and continues to be significantly shortchanged. If we are to flourish and grow in the ways you detail in our long-term plan, every effort must be made to reverse these negative statistics. Inclusion and genuine power sharing is essential. Environmentally, it would be hard to argue that the stewardship of the last 180 years has protected or enhanced our environment. Had Māori been engaged and involved, how different could things have been? You imagine for a minute that Ngā Hapu o Te Whanganui a Roto would have allowed what we call the Inner Harbour, one of their key economic resources, to have become so badly polluted and degraded. Granting Māori wards is not a panacea. It's actually a minor move and won't significantly remedy or address the failures of the last 181 years. It's a simple, some could say churlish mechanism that doesn't reflect the intent of our founding document. However, by not adopting them, you would be sending out a very strong signal that will not only reinforce and augment the feelings of alienation that so many Māori justifiably feel. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any questions from councillors? Councillor Tupney. I'm sincerely hope this doesn't become the pattern for the next two <laughs> days, Your Worship. <clears throat> uh, greetings, Mark. Thank you very much for your well-researched and well-articulated um, submission. Um, and I picked up on some of your comments for further reading. Um, my question to you is particularly around... Sorry, thank you. Um, my question to you is particularly around your view as a member of the general role. Um, in your opinion, 
So throughout this process, Napier City Council has sought to get a legal opinion on treaty partnership for councils versus the Crown, etc., etc., and it's pretty consistent nationally. Uh, the result we got from our legal advice was that we are technically, as an organisation, not a partner to the treaty. So um, not wanting to get into that <coughs> aspect, my question to you is, does the treaty apply to only the Crown and Māori in your point of view? And if this is true in your opinion, as a citizen, so this is really the question, not the first half so much, as a citizen and a member of uh, the general role, what do you see as your personal obligation to the Treaty of Waitangi? Okay, um, I am only here because of the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. That, that's my, my view. I, I see myself almost as Tangata Tiriti. Um, my ancestors, you know, four or five generations back, came here only because of the mechanism of Te Tiriti signed in 1840, which I believe the Māori genuinely believe was a, a unique opportunity that they could pivot from to enhance the economy, and they did very successfully for 20 or 30 years until the population changed and suddenly we are one people and we should all have the same rights became a much more important view than when Māori were the majority. So I see I have an obligation towards the treaty as a person that has entered this country because of that document. I think it's very sad that in 1852, when New Zealand became um, had its own representational, um, you know, the four province, the, the provinces and the, the houses of parliament, that no recognition was given to the founding document. Thank you very much. No further questions, you wish. Thank you. Following on from that uh, question from Councillor Tuppany, uh, Mark, one of the arguments we often hear against Māori wards is that we are all one people and uh, why should Māori be uh, given their own wards? And so I'd be interested to hear your, your views on comments and statements like that that are made. I, I think it, it's very interesting that those comments only started to rise once um, the settler community actually had a vast majority of people. Prior to that, they weren't so keen, as was evidenced, that there were no Māori in Parliament, there were no Māori in the Hawke's Bay Provincial Council, and there were virtually, well, there have been very few Māori that have made it to the City Council. Um, I, I um, don't believe, well, no, there will be special arrangements, but those special arrangements will reflect the constitutional document that founded this country, in the way that if I'm a citizen of Wyoming, I get one congressman, but I get two senators. Whereas if I'm a citizen of um, California, I get, you know, I'll, I'll get one congressman for every, well, I think it's about 600,000 people, but I only also only get two senators. So, you know, in the House of Lords in Britain, you know, special interest groups have strong representation that can determine what all should happen. Uh, the same things happen across any other democracy that you look at. We're quite unique in not having those arrangements. And I think it's very sad. And I don't think we can point to our successes by having ignored the people who have been here for a long time um, to the extent that we have. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Thank Thanks. you very much for your time today. I'd like to invite Jeremy Dunningham to present to us, please. Welcome. Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi te hoki kau. Te hei mauri ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Acknowledgements to all. I acknowledge uh, Mother Earth and to the house that stands here, to the departed. Rest in eternal peace. Return to the home of, of the person. To us, the living faces. I acknowledge as all. My name is Jeremy Dunningham. Manga Kieke is my mountain. Madam Chair, councillors, staff, thank you for the opportunity to present this submission. I intend to explain why I support the idea of Māori wards 
in this council and the, the, the path I took to come to that conclusion. During the 70s, 80s and 90s, I was a probation officer and a community worker in central and southern Auckland. I soon realised that the most effective way I could work would be to become involved with the many community initiatives which had established themselves to address the problems of crime and rehabilitation amongst their relevant people, in the main Māori and Pacifica, overrepresented in our criminal justice system. This process led me to Te Reo, the Tikanga and the history of Tangata Whenua, sometimes a challenging place for a Pākehā educated in the school curriculum of the time. I also learnt how it felt to be in a minority and the discomfort that came with that. I was gently but firmly prodded and challenged in many of my assumptions, always done with manakitanga and generosity. I also became aware of the institutional bias against such community initiatives and the distrust existing amongst institutional staff in the areas of management, governance, finance, etc., on the part of community initiatives. And I was warned on many occasions that I would probably be damaging my uh, prospects of a career if I continued on this path. I read, listened and learned as widely as I could the history of Tangata Whenua both before and after colonisation. There were a number of points that stood out. One, Tangata Whenua adapted very quickly to the ideas and practices which arrived with the later colonisers. Two, they adapted too quickly for the likes of many colonisers, for example, in the coastal shipping trade, where their group ethos and navigation and sailing skills and local knowledge made them the preferred carriers of goods. We also saw the same with communal farming carried out by groups of Māori, particularly in the likes of the ideal villages run by Tafiti and his friends. And again, the communal emphasis and ethos and working method made them more competitive often than their Pākehā counterparts and aroused their envy and suspicion. And the last point, Tangata Whenua's steadfast faith in the rule of law, as they perceived it stemming from Victoria, the Queen of England, through the means of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And it is in this area that the most injustice was done. On each occasion, when a legal challenge had been painstakingly and thoroughly researched and assembled, in an attempt at a legal redress for some injustice, if it looked like Tangata Whenua were going to succeed, the crown of the time, simply by virtue of its majority in government, changed the law or shifted the goalpost, if you want a sports analogy. Through the latter half of the 19th century and most of the 20th century, this occurred on a regular basis, denying generations of Tangata Whenua justice and a fair deal in their homeland. This was only possible because, being in a minority in a Pākehā-dominated government system, local and national, they could not affect any change or influence thinking. For anyone who has read of these struggles, it is heartbreaking. Yet Tangata Whenua never lost faith. For this reason, I have always supported any shift in the goalposts towards Tangata Whenua aspirations. To a purist, it might seem anti-democratic, one person, one vote, but it's just as anti-democratic to deny a people's place in the sun by legislative means which they can't hope to overturn. There is also an argument that it's patronising to Tangata Whenua to give them special privilege as if they were incapable of two tangata or standing tall themselves. As a Pākehā, I think this falls into the red herring category, a classic diversionary tactic, and besides, it is not for Pākehā to decide what or is not patronising for tangata whenua. The other point is, and it's come up already, is that we already have two tangata whenua representatives on the Napier City Council and two on the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, which is wonderful, but historically, it's taken 170 years to get there, and I think it's a bit of an anomaly. I've always believed that having tangata whenua input and decision-making ability around the table in any context brings a richer and wider approach to any issue to the betterment of all. To that end, I support the legislative change introduced by the current government concerning the referendum on the issue, and I support Napier City Council establishing, with proper consultation, Māori ward seats on council. As a final thought, we only need to look at the recent issue of COVID-19 vaccination rates amongst Tangata Whenua and Pacifica 
For months, relevant EU organisations and Urban Morai spokespersons have been urging government health authorities to reach out and involve local Tangata Whenua communities in order to prepare them for the advent of vaccination kaupapa. Yet those health authorities initially kept such requests at arm's length, again showing that one, Tangata Whenua were not at the decision-making table, and two, the historical institutional distrust of local Tangata Whenua community initiatives was alive and well. The recent surge in vaccination rates shows just how effective it is when Tangata Whenua were involved. I'll leave you with a short Whakatoki proverb. No te rauro, naku te rauro, ka ora te manuhiri. Translated, with your food basket and my food basket, we are able to feed our guests. But the implication is that two peoples working together on a project will be more successful than if one partner is denied access, a voice and a contribution. Thank you. Kia ora, Jeremy. Thank you. I'll just invite any councillors that may have questions. Councillor Tapani. <laughs> thank you. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, tēnā koe. Thank you very much for your mihi earlier on. Um, so I'm just acknowledging that mihi uh, respectfully. Uh, my question to you is around some of your comments. And, sorry. My question to you is around some of the comments in your submission, particularly um, that you've provided today. You spoke of legislative barriers which makes the ability for Māori to participate in this de democratic system as unattainable. Um, are you referring to such things as the ability of a person on the general role to have a say on whether or not I as a Māori can or should or how I use my vote? Or are you speaking of What's the reference behind some of those legislative barriers? Well, it's a long history of legislative change throughout from 1840 onwards. I'm not referring to what you just asked, but I'm referring to the history where every time Tangata Whenua looked like they were making success, some success in a legal challenge, uh, the government changed the rules. And as you could even argue that the foreshore and seabed issue was one of those. But there's a whole stack of stuff that goes over years, decades and decades and decades, where that happened. And I don't see how uh, Tangata Whenua could have argued against that when they didn't have the votes and the numbers. Thank you very much. There's no the, the, the questions. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us today, Jeremy. Kia ora. Thank you. I'd like to invite John Wise to come up next, please. Mm. Welcome, John. Great to see you. Good to see you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Oh, John. Um, would it be possible for the names of the speakers to go on the live stream? Because at the moment, if people don't hear what you have to say, um, they won't know when they're watching who it is they're watching. That would need to be a question of our technical people, if that's... Thank you. Tēnā koutou koutoua. Ko John Waisaho and uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to what I consider to be a really important issue. Use the mic. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the technology here is the same as my technology at home. The mic. Oh, no. Use the mic, John. Yes, please. Use the microphone. Either one. Is that movable? Yep. yep it'll move. Yeah. Is that better? Um, can you hear me? A little bit. Yeah. We can hear you. It may, it may be difficult for the people on live stream to hear you if you are. Here we go. Here's our... Can you hear me now? Guru. Hold that thought. That's all right. Handheld coming. Ah, there we go. Oh, he's coming. Oh, right, OK. Tēnā koutou John Wiseho. And I was just saying that how grateful I am to be here for this uh, 10 minutes and for the other, listen to the other valuable contributions. I'm hoping this 
technology is, is exactly the same as mine. If not, I'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> John, just so you're aware, the desk mics will pick you up now. Is it These ones will pick you up now. They're working. Let me say right from the start that I'm representing myself here. Um, and secondly, that what I'm proposing in this presentation uh, is not outside of my experience. I have experienced all of these things that I'm proposing to you. So although they might seem left field, difficult to achieve, I can assure you that they are achievable. So I support Mari Ward's representation and the belief that it will create a new dynamic at the council table. And the theme of my presentation is going forward from here. All right. Accepting this may be tense and difficult at times, but it also has the potential to blossom into an innovative collaboration. So my submission focuses on three examples of achievable outcomes arising from Māori Awards. Firstly, working together, new strategies will be created. An outcome, an achievable outcome, is equity for Māori. A third theme is that a collective commitment, that is, council, mana whenua, the wider community, council, that will result in a building of capacity, not only within the council, and in within the wider community, but specifically within the, in, in the Māori community. Let me have a look at what I mean by co-creation. In my short written submission, I use the term more than once. And I want to explain to you what that means to me. The following, it's on, it'll be on the wall there for you. quote is from Lao Tzu, the famous uh, author of Tao Te Ching, two and a half thousand years ago. He happened to be also a, um, a council employee. He said, between what you bring and what I bring lies the field of limitless possibilities. I'll meet you there. Between what you bring and what I bring lies the field of limitless opportunities, possibilities. I'll meet you there. So I'm identifying the I in that quote as te ao Pākehā, the you as te ao Māori. My understanding of te ao Māori is of an interconnected, interdependent system across the natural and the built worlds. Te Ao Pākehā is very difficult for me to define. I don't even know if there is such a thing. But in terms of meeting you there, I put it in the context of the council culture. What is more important right now is the palpable shift in Pākehā awareness of Māori social and economic inequities and the will to partner with Māori to address these. And that's what I want to focus on. So, channeling Lao Tzu to the council table in the future, we have Te Ao Māori and Te Ao Pākehā meeting at this table. And so I want to talk about a process, a process of what I call deep listening, Deep listening is not listening to respond. Deep listening is listening to feel and listening to understand. What does that lead to? That leads to 
the process of understanding each other, honouring our differences, developing respect and trust, discovering what is important to us and establishing a mutual will to get things done. We establish a powerful, empowering space where new ideas are created, nurtured and enacted. And there's that space. That's the space of the creation of limitless possibilities. And I'm going to focus just on capacity building and equitable outcomes for Māori. I want you to have a look at that picture up there because in my discussions prior to preparing this, I've become aware that there's confusion amongst my friends and relations of equality and equity and what that means. And I think it's vital that we do understand that and share that understanding at the, uh, the new environment in the council table. Equality is when everybody gets the same resource. So what you see there is three people, three children standing watching the game and they're all standing on the same sized box. That's equality of resources, but it does not lead to equity of outcome. The small child still can't see. The tall one has got a better view than he had before. Equity is how we distribute the resources so that the outcome is equal. And in that drawing, that demonstrates that quite nicely. All three children are able to share in the joy of that game through unequal distribution of resources. It's a positive outcome. The other point I wanted to make, and the last point, is a collective commi the commitment to Māori capacity building. Excuse me whilst I just take a short, short drink. Coming from a background of community-driven social and economic development. I know that community, economic and social development is a bottom-up, inclusive process. The community makes decisions and the community initiates the changes. In this empowering process, individuals and communities develop new insights, new skills and a new awareness of the possibility that they can determine their own future. The Council has a key support role and resourcing role in this process. If you ever doubt that the community's willingness to engage and take responsibility, just think recently of the Napier flood response by Mana Whenua and yesterday's Superfax response, or on a larger scale locally on the success of the Ngāti Kahunganu Iwi Incorporated. Zach Makorade, a friend of ours, said, collective energies are more likely to succeed than solo efforts. That wraps everything up beautifully. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mayor. Thank you very much, John. Uh, do we have any questions from councillors? Hi. Thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure, and thank you very much for the opportunity. You're welcome. I would like to invite Pat McGill, please. Kia ora, Pat. How are we? Good, thank you. How are you? 
Kia ora whanau of Napier um, City Council. Um, Ko Pat McGill, Tauko Ingwa, born in Napier, 1926. Most of my time I've be, been spent um, running Treaty of Waitangi workshops so we can um, educate the masses in the city. You'll be pleased to know that a workshop started at the Presbyterian Church on Saturday and Sunday with a whole new band of treaty practitioners and uh, so it's another service that we'll have for the city. Um, well, <coughs> naturally John and I, we always differ but we, um, <coughs> we're very good natured when we differed. So I start off by saying Ahuriri Napier Māori Wards. When Te Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, Te Pākehā comprised 2,000 residents, whalers, whoever they were, and we were a bit of a worry. Māori, according to Robert Constantine, in Healing Our History, the challenge of the Treaty of Waitangi had Māori estimated at 200,000. By the turn of the century, 750,000, 750 Pākehā, that's correct, 750 Pākehā, 46,000 Māori remained. Māori wards are an, insert, an insult to Māori. <coughs> For 1,200 consecutive days, I supported former racist New Plymouth Mayor Andrew Judd, with Tangata Whenua seeking a kinder and fairer nation through to Treaty of Waitangi. Not Māori wards as such. Māori wards, every day Māori contributed as to what they wanted. They don't want Māori wards, they want the Treaty of Waitangi. It's not Māori wards. Fortunately, Andrew Judd will share progress as a speaker at this conference. Mostly white leadership at Crown and local level are struggling to comprehend the benefits of us honouring the Treaty of Waitangi, while both Māori with Tauiwi are struggling separately towards strengthening our communities and not building more expensive prisons. As a former JP, the Napier Court is not a nice place. While a bicultural approach to, poor, to problem solving is in the beautiful foyer carving by Sandy Adset, it was carved at the opening of the court and it said a bicultural approach toward problem solving. But unfortunately it sits alone in the Napier foyer. It is worth commend Andrew Judd responded to a challenge from Robert Constantine after reading his book. Robert Constantine, in his book, when he points out, as does Claudia Orange or Michael King, point out what actually happened in the virtually genocide of the loss of land from this nation. And very few people, I don't know why, after they read Constantine or attend a lecture of Constantine, when given the opportunity to do what Andrew Judd has done, and that's come out and bear to a da dare to be a Daniel, um, <coughs> somehow don't, but the best thing that happened to this country is Andrew Judd's tenaciousness and honesty towards this nation. Now you're aware of the hurt and the loss of land and mana of Māori, how will you respond? Thank you, Pat. Do councillors have any questions for Pat? Councillor Tapani. Tēnā koe, Pat. Uh, my question is to you as a... Um... Can you speak up a bit? I'm creeping on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, Pat. 
Tēnā koe, thank you for your submission. Uh, with regards to your role and connection to Napier Pilot City Trust, um, do you think that there is an opportunity here for Napier to use the Pilot City um, assignment or co-papa um, in, in a way that could positively move this conversation. I know you guys already are with the uh, Treaty of Waitangi workshops and a number of events they're holding um, in the past. Do you think there's a role that we may have overlooked or that we could build on that fits well with the Napier Pilot City Trust and their aims and purpose? Well, it, <coughs> excuse me. It's like not knowing our own history. I'd, I just had a battle the other day at the community. Sorry, Pat, you'll have to make allowances for my age and move closer um, to the mic. It, it's just that we don't know our own history. And I was having a little battle the other day at the community college, and lots of things are written. And there's a Maori woman, Elizabeth Keeper, out there. And I was explaining what happened at the college when National changed and all that sort of thing. And when I said in 1977, when the social development came up and said what was happening with non-vocational education, she said, this is car pie good news. And we don't, we've never shared the car pie good news of the city. And because of the people responding, it's the people that have responded, not the leaders. We've had to put up with John Harrison, we've had to put up with Herbert, we've had to put up with bloody hell in this town. And, and but, We've stuck to it because the people themselves were on it. And once you honour people, the Jim Morungas and the Moro Patinis and those people there, you give the people the strength and, the, and this nation becomes mighty. So getting back to your, your question, when you look at the Roper Report, what it said to Napier, other government departments, what they've said to Napier, it wasn't to the leadership of Napier they said it, it was to the resolve of the people. So you can, you can do anything because it's all written down in writing. And there's so much goodwill out there, you know, with Mona Jackson coming up with New Zealand as a Moana and Puppetunuku, that um, Napier is a pilot city and there would never be another part of city because it was designated as a pilot city to look to alternatives to violence. And the Pilot City Trust will continue to do that and bring in, and bring in people and encourage them to better their lives, their way. Ngā mihi, Pat. Thank you very much. Have I answered you? Thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you very much, Pat. I'd now like to welcome Charlie Mudgeway, who I believe is being supported by Case Tarpany, Kate Skidmore and Jack Evans. Welcome. Kia tau mai i te aroha, ngā manaakitanga o te atua. Ki a rangi nui rawa ko papatonuku. Te love and the blessings of the above be brought to upon us all, to the house that stands. Stand tall to those who have departed. Rest in eternal peace. And to us the living faces. Tātou ki hunga mate, tātou ki a rātou. Uh, Before we begin, to all. I'd like to first acknowledge uh, all the Komatua who have come here today and all the, the councillors, along with those who have come, to represent their views and speak on this issue. Kia ora. Kia ora. 
Kotokato. We are the Oyam Youth Advocacy Group. Our team is dedicated to the values of fairness and social justice. By utilising multimedia platforms, we endeavour to provide a fresh youth perspective on the issues that matter most to New Zealanders. We believe Māori wards talk... <laughs> Sorry. We've come today to talk on why we believe Māori wards are important towards fair democracy in Ahurere. I'll pass it on to Charlie. And here today we have myself, Kate, Case Tapane, and Jack. Kia ora, thank you, Kate. Um, since the founding of New Zealand's various democratic institutions, there's been a significant underrepresentation of Māori within both our local and national governments. Thus, democratic mechanisms such as Māori wards are designed to see increased Māori representation on our councils. Much of the support and opposition to Māori wards boils down to the common argument with me, within many other topical issues in New Zealand, this being the debate between equality and equity. Currently, local councils operate an equal-based approach to representation and voting, giving all New Zealanders the option to vote for a councillor within their respective general ward. However, the obvious issue with this approach is that Māori are significantly underrepresented on many of our local councils across Aotearoa, as it's much more difficult for Māori, for Māori advocating solely for Māori issues to be elected by a general ward. This indicates that equality, this equality-based approach to voting is not necessarily providing proportional outcomes. Um, to back this up, a study undertaken by the Electoral Commission found that voters just on the Māori roll represented over 10% of New Zealand's population, but only saw a 5.7% member representation on councils. So the problem with this equality-based approach also, uh, when it comes to the policy decisions of council, is that often the decisions can have a proportionately higher impact on Māori communities. And what Māori wards establish is an equity-based approach to the represented nature of our local councils. Equity ensures that everyone's different circumstances are acknowledged and everyone's needs are met, an example of fairness. Applying this to our democratic system through the establishment of Māori wards ensures that the value of equity, fairness, is seen in the representation on our local councils. And this is an element that is expected of our councils under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, ratified under the 2002 Local Governments Act. This established the relationship to, between the obligations of the Crown to Te Tiriti and local governments. Where Māori are underrepresented in our local councils, Māori wards attempts to be the mechanism that ensures these equitable outcomes for policy from local governing bodies. And this is also a win for democracy. Not only is our democracy more representative as a result of Māori wards, which arguably is the very basis of democracy, but it also provides further perspective on the issues that matter to all New Zealanders. And this increase in perspective is what democracy should always strive to thrive on. The equity approach that this Māori wards proposal endeavours to achieve is not only great for increasing Māori representation, but also strengthens the very democracy that Aotearoa is marvelled around the world for. I'll pass it on to Case. Te Tiriti o Waitangi is the founding document of Aotearoa. And what that calls for is equitable representation between both Pākehā and Māori, uh, which is especially important when it comes to things around policies such as councils. Um, although Napier City Council does have Māori uh, councillors who have been elected on the general role, a large issue that comes with this is that they have to represent the area they were elected to represent. That means even though they may have some views due to their Māori heritage that they want to bring up and um, arise and bring a light to, they may not be able to do this due to conflict of interest that arise because they have to represent their given area. As a result, this can lead to a kind of haze or a mis some misinformation about whether Māori are truly represented. What Māori wards allow us to do is ensure there is a Māori vote that also is someone who is there to represent Māori at the table. 
Because it's all well and good to say, nah, 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 we've got a Māori sitting there, we're fine. But in reality, that Māori has to think about Pākehā views and any other ethnicity that comes in their ward. So by enabling uh, Ahuriri Council to have Māori wards, we're ensuring there is someone there to make sure important issues to Māori are being thought of from the beginning. What this also creates is it creates a situation where Māori and local iwi and hapu are put in a proactive rather than reactive position. Because they're in the conversation and able to talk from the beginning, uh, it creates an environment where they're able to have influence before it comes as a near finished product that is a lot harder to change in many situations. <coughs> uh, another key part of a Māori ward is it ensures a Māori vote. And what a vote is, is it's, um, it's something that's written down and shown that this was the opinion of the elected person on the Māori ward. They voted no, they voted yes. Because uh, that is a lot clearer than reading through hours of minutes or having someone talk to something. Which is why, although it's well and good that we have that representation currently with council, um, the step that we need to take now is giving some power behind that voice and that whakaaro. <coughs> uh, all in all, Māori wards are important to giving some mana back to our local iwi and hapu. Uh, and many of my points were covered by previous speakers, such as Chad Tariha, who I'd like to acknowledge. Um, so, overall, I believe that this is an important step for council to take to improve Māori representation and aid in the future endeavours we may take towards a more equitable society. And I'll pass it on to Jack Evans, along with the mic. Thank you. Um, so a large part of our perspective is uh, youth. And um, the four of us here, we, we're all always listening to what the youth perspective is uh, with regards to today, Māori wards. Um, something that we've noticed uh, among our, our parents' generations uh, is a lot of rhetoric around um, Māori wards being separationist. Um, and this kind of uh, traditional approach to uh, democracy where it's about equality, uh, less so about equity. Um, I would like to address those uh, arguments and say that they largely do gloss over um, colonisation and uh, the current lack of representation within um, New Zealand democracy uh, at a council level and national level. Uh, we believe, uh, as the youth, that this is, this is the way of the future, um, increasing our, our Māori representation uh, in, in council. And so we believe that if we're, if we're not to um, put this forward now, uh, we're only going to be kicking the can down the road for future generations to implement. We, as the youth, will be, will be dealing with um, the repercussions of a lack of representation. Uh, and so we, we strongly urge for uh, this to be voted through. Uh, to summarise, I'd like to uh, reference what Case said about a uh, proactive rather than reactive uh, approach. We think that um, the council here should be taking a proactive approach and be looking uh, and always trying to work with Māori to uh, better representation and better outcomes uh, in Ahuriri. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, open up for questions from the councillors. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Uh, kia ora, Kate and Chase and Charlie and Jack. Thank you very much uh, for coming to speak to us. One of the um, issues that I suppose I'd like to, to tease out with you, um, and I think it was mentioned a couple of times in uh, the verbal submissions from Charlie and Case, is that concept of advocating solely for Māori. Um, so those who are voted in on a Māori ward would, um, and I think as you put it, have a Māori vote, uh, be advocating solely for Māori issues. And I understand that perspective. What I'm seeing um, in the submissions is actually a, a bit of a misunderstanding around how Māori wards would work under the legislation. And in fact, you take an oath, uh, no matter whether you're elected on the Māori role um, or on the general role, to represent the whole city. And so there isn't actually any difference in terms of representation. You're required to, um, I suppose, consider 
the whole of the city, I suppose is what the oath and the act is. And so I'm just interested in your view. We saw firm uh, submitters earlier speak to it not necessarily being about, like you say, representing Māori and a Māori vote, but more having that guaranteed world view of Māori around the table. So just interested in your views on that concept. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, to answer that, uh, I suppose what we are saying is that similarly to how, although they would be there uh, representing and taking in the views of all of Ahuriri, um, similar to how different councillors, when they are going, have to think about what their uh, certain areas also are thinking, which they're elected to represent, um, it would, we imagine there would be a similar area where the views they would be bringing are those views that you mentioned, which are the um, kind of maori dim based uh, views which would be coming with someone of Māori descent. Um, so although we... Um, so, yeah, I suppose we agree with what you're saying. We're, it's not uh, Māori voters and it's for Māori saying this is what Māori want. It's more uh, what they're saying is that of uh, who elects them and the city with that added bonus of having some more... Uh, well, being influenced by the Māori culture, if that answers your question. Kia ora, thank you. Councillor Bose. Um, kia ora, um, all four of you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm, it's great to hear from young people, Rangatahi. Um, I just wondered if you could just give us a little bit of information about your organisation. Is it, is it one school, many schools? Um, and so the basic um, sort of kaupapa of it, please. It's very encouraging. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Councillor. Um, so our organisation operates uh, a couple of different media kind of things. We operate a podcast um, that sort of looks at different topical issues around New Zealand. So um, part of what we talk about, we'll look at certain current events, um, but also looking at past historical events. And just really not only getting a youth perspective, though that is probably our sort of main area of expertise, if, um, if I don't mind saying that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're, we're wanting to kind of provide um, alternative perspectives to things. We're wanting to create um, a, a sort of a platform of discussion where um, we're providing alternative perspectives that may prompt people to think um, a little bit more about their own personal decisions on certain um, issues, something like Māori wards. We have done a couple of episodes on Māori wards. Um, and we really think it's our responsibility um, as a media organisation to come along and just showcase our perspective as youth um, on this particular issue. So, yeah, that, that's sort of what our organisation sort of covers. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, just to add to that, um, at the moment, the people who are involved in the Oyam Youth Advocacy Group, uh, we're all members of the same school who kind of um, came together with the goal of kind of sharing a youth perspective in our discussions. Yeah. Councillor Mawson and then Councillor Crown. Yeah, great, great presentation, guys. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, question. Or oh, yum. Who thought of the name and why? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, so oh, it's a shame. Um, one of our members isn't here to kind of give insight, but basically we were playing a game uh, and one of the cards, there was a card game and one of the things was fish and chips, to which I responded, oh, yum. And um, we, that ended up keep being repeated because um, <laughs> they said it was the most Kiwi thing they ever heard, and that eventually transitioned into the name. Perfect. Well done, Just being you. quintessential young Kiwis. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Good week, guys. Thank you. Kia ora guys, thank you so much for um, sharing your whakaro and your kōrero with us today. Um, I've got a question around equity, so, um, and I guess I'm playing a little bit with the meaning of that, so for some of the submitters um, previously today, they've kind of referred to it as power sharing, or I suppose the redistribution of, of power and how we share that. Um, and for a number of the submitters that we've, um, that have participated in this process and that we've read through their submissions, that's been a real concern for them, that redistribution of power, um, and, and that comes with Māori wards. And I want to know why you guys aren't concerned about that. Um, well, I would disagree with the statement that 
um, equity is about redistributing power. I think equity is solely based around the argument of fairness. And Māori wards, the proposal here today, is merely adding a almost a voice, um, a furthering the voice of um, Māori on our councils. And I think that's what equity talks more about than um, reallocating resources. Um, there's been a lot of talk about resources um, with equity, which it, 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 that is what it is. It isn't about reallocating the resources of um, voting or anything like that that gives uh, a particular group an unfair advantage or a redistributed power advantage. Um, it's about ensuring that once voting has resolved and once voting is done, that the council makeup that represents that population represents the population in the most fair way possible. Um, certainly I think that's what all of our members uh, in this group believe equity talks about um, for us, and especially in the context of Māori wards. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. In case um, you may have something to add. Yeah, yeah, kind of adding to that. Um, to say that it's a redistribution of resources in terms of, of power um, is kind of funny because what that then suggests is that power is limited. Um, what I would question is why can't we have, um, why can't we leave a general wards with the same power and mana they have and just give more mana and power to things like Māori wards. It's not necessarily shifting away, it's mm. simply adding. Because in reality, uh, there is no limit on power and mana. Um, you add it um, in your own head, in your mind. We largely see um, Māori wards as only empowering the Napier City Council uh, as an entity and like, as a perspective. So. Councillor Tarpany. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, I have a question and then a statement to Council. Um, fantastic to have your submission. I read your submission, Charlie, on behalf of the Oh Yum podcast crew. Um, oh, yum. It was encouraging oh, yum. to see, and uh, it's great to see you four survive the school holidays. <laughs> um, so, Currently, the decision before Napier City Council, if it goes ahead and is positive, will present an opportunity to have Māori wards by 2025. So as a fresh youth perspective, by 2025, you'll be in a position to vote. So as a collective, what is your expectation of what Napier, in your opinion, as a quintessential youth, um, heading into a, uh, this future, what is your expectation around what you hope Napier City will look like by 2025? Uh, honestly, I think it will be very climate conscious. Uh, we, we're right next to the sea. Um, it's, it's a reminder every day that we need to do better um, with regards to the climate. Um, I, I see, yeah, a, uh, a further empowered um, population voting on uh, issues that are pressing to them uh, and that really do matter. Can, I'll just add to that as well, if you don't mind. Um, also with, I think, when we do eventually um, uh, end up in 2025, hopefully, um, hopefully the seas don't rise too quickly, um, I wish to see a council through this um, legislation and this proposal with Māori wards, focusing more on um, the issues that are really important to not only Māori, but also to all New Zealanders, but proportionally impact on Māori more. I feel that um, there has always been a bit of a lack of uh, discussion around issues of uh, social policy, social housing policy, um, uh, resource management, that I think that through Māori wards we're going to be hearing a lot more of perspective, not only for council as a decision body, but also for new, uh, Napierites who are listening to um, what the council has to say as you know politicians and what councils have to say as politicians. Um, I think that that increase in representation around um, certain aspects of policy is just going to be really, really good at not only increasing um, participation in local government, but also um, seeing that almost a, a, a tighter relationship between the Napier people and um, the council as well, which I think is what democracy is all about. So I think we're going to be seeing a brighter future in 2025. Now, mihi nunu ki koutou. Thank you very much for your whakaaro. And um, on a personal note, um, I'm really encouraged by the future if our leadership looks like you four. Um, on, on that note, 
unaware that Mr Case Tarpany was be a part of the team submitting on behalf of the podcast crew, uh, so I'll declare my conflict, conflict of interest that my son is one of the speakers at the table here today. Um, but um, I have, right from the outset of this process, uh, maintained an open mind, which included running every submission that was provided to me, and I'll make my decision based on the facts presented over these submissions. Kia ora. Kia ora. There's no further questions. Thank you all very much um, for bringing your youth perspective to us today and some very um, insightful thinking. Thank you. Now, I don't think I've seen Harlem arrive. I'll just... No, he's not speaking today. Um, so, and I will just check, is Maria Roberts here? Ah, Maria, well, if, you're, if you're happy to speak now, then we'd... Yeah, no, absolutely. We'll, we'll welcome you up. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I have something to table. Do I? How do I do that? Well, can I get yeah. Anna or Carolyn? Can we just get you to? Hello. <laughs> I have something to table. Do I give it to someone else? Maria Roberts My name is Maria Roberts and I am a foreigner. I grew up alongside the side of the Te Taikuri River. I grew up uh, in the rich lands of Ngāti Kahungunu. I reside in uh, Namibia South. And acknowledging I have my written submission here, so I'll go through it, but I'll add to it just to add some value for actually being here and taking up the time. Um, I'm a member of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand, and I'm one of the co-conveners of the Hawke's Bay branch. So um, I'm not a spokesperson for the Green Party, but I do bring their support for Māori wards. In this role, as well as a resident of Ahuriri Napier, I would like to give my support to the proposal of having Māori wards as part of Napier City Council. On the 18th of May 2021, I took part in the hikoi by Te Tawhenua o Te Whanganui o Urotu. The tangata whenua on this hikoi made it very clear that they wanted Māori wards and therefore a permanent place at the council table. As someone who is brought up on their lands, I support their position. And um, from my perspective, and um, I would like to add to that, that I think there's a real potential for damage to the wairua of tangata whenua if we don't go through with Māori wards. Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand supports guaranteed participation of tangata whenua at local government level in its Te Tiriti o Waitangi tangi policy and local government policy. So um, we understand that there's more than one way for tangata whenua to be involved, not only the Māori wards, but tangata whenua want Māori wards, so we support that. So in our um, Tiriti policy, the Māori parliamentary seats should be entrenched and tangata whenua should have guaranteed participation in local government. Um, the rangatiratanga of tangata whenua is a collective human right protected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. To add to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Human Rights Commission sees Te Tiriti o Waitangi in tandem with the United Universal Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. And that's the document that I've just tabled. That document is um, 
available through the Human Rights Commission and it's in Te Reo as well as English. There's 46 um, articles in that declaration and um, self-determination and partic participation are the core principles. When looking at the Napier City Council website, I saw that the Māori Wards webpage was in both English and Te Reo. This is my first indication that even the discussion about Māori Wards has changed something for the better. When I looked through the website just quickly, I couldn't see um, anything else written in Te Reo, even in Māori Language Week, which surprised me, or visible inclusion of Matauranga Māori. In its current failure to establish Māori wards, the Napier City Council has overlooked Te Tiriti or Waitangi and all the potential this could hold. So by potential, um, I agree with the rangatahi who have just spoken, that um, Māori representatives bring Mātauranga Māori Māori to the table. They add mana, they have all their experience with the whenua, and, and in this time of climate change, it's not a nice add-on, it's a necessity that we have mātauranga Māori and people with that knowledge at the table. On the 24th of July 2021, along with other Green Party members, I attended an event of Tai Te Tai Whenua o Te Whanganui a Orotu to hear Andrew Judge, the former Mayor of New Plymouth, speak about racism from a personal point of view. I agree with his view that cities need Māori wards and also with the statement in his speech that the children are watching, the children are learning and I agree with what the rangatahi have just said now that it will be the youth that will pick up the pieces of inequity in our huriri and if we don't listen to what tangata whenua want now those youth, as they become adults, will be picking up the pieces. The children are watching, the children are learning, and so I'm thinking of um, Pākehara children and Tauiwi children. We have the choice um, of adding to the, them being informed or misinformed. And we, for the tamariki rangatahi of our tangata whenua, we have the choice of having them feel uplifted or downgraded. Māori wards are a way for us to signal the way for the next generation. I support mana whenua in their quest for Māori wards for Napier City Council. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Maria. I'll just open up for any questions from councillors. Uh, there being none, thank you very much for taking the time and coming That's to speak okay. to us today. Thank you. Kia ora. Uh, so we do not have any further submitters due until quarter past six now. Uh, so we will have a slightly longer than anticipated uh, break for our dinner. Uh, thank you once again to all of our submitters who have uh, spoken to us in our first session today. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be seeing some of you back uh, over the next couple of days as well. Has he gone? I still not here. She's gone. Sorry, Your Worship. They just didn't hear. I saw Charlie's name on the submission, knew who they were, didn't even make it. <laughs>